Hello and welcome to the BCM Tech Help Show. I am your host, Craig Chamberlain, and this is PCM Tech Talk Live. That's right, PCM Tech Talk Live with the PCM Tech Help Show. And what we do here is we talk live about tech and everything tech. For the first 10 minutes of this show to 15 minutes of the show, we will talk about today installing Ubuntu Linux. That's right. Linux Ubuntu is one of the most popular Linux distributions, if not the most popular distribution of today. And there's a lot of talk of it in social media, as well as pretty much any other tech arena, that they're becoming really big in the mobile platform as well. So a lot of you may have been wondering, how do you install Linux on your computer? Well, Linux is, as you know, free, and Ubuntu is no different. It'll allow you to install it right on Windows. That's what we're going to be doing here in the first part of the show. And in the second part of the show, you guys can ask any questions you'd like. They don't have to be related to the topic at hand, but they can be any question you might have on any tech-related issue or personal. It's up to you. Pretty much anything goes. This is a show for you guys, my subscribers, and it's a lot of fun. We're on episode 26 already. And our community, really awesome communities, up to 162 members. Make sure you join completely free on Google Plus, pcmtechhelp.com forward slash community. Now to get things rolling today, I'm going to be actually sharing my screen for the most part so you guys can monitor what's going on. And uh, hopefully you can give me a little bit of feedback here on how good the picture quality is. I'm pretty sure that uh, Google's done a good job of bringing up the screen quality here. And I'd like to walk you guys through what I'm doing uh, right here on the installation. Today we're going to be working with VirtualBox, for those who don't know what that is. It's a free website software package. I'm sorry, a free software package that lets you virtualize operating systems or install more than one operating system on your computer. Let me go ahead and open it here real quick. I'm going to show you where I can, uh, where I can, where you can get it here in a second. It's free. You can just Google Oracle VirtualBox. But as always, my tutorials include uh, I usually include software that's also available on my website, that's pcmtechhelp.com. And uh, you can actually find the Oracle Virtual Box right at my website. Uh, let's bring this up here real quick. I've been working on my website loading speed. Hopefully things are, uh, are kind of bouncing back on that. But you go to Operating Systems, highlight Free Downloads, go down to Operating Systems, and then Virtualization, and then you want to select Virtual Box. That'll actually bring you to the Virtual Box downloader. You can go there and install it yourself. Now, I'm not going to walk you through that step in particular, but first let's download Ubuntu, okay? Very, very easy to find. Just go to Ubuntu.com, and uh, this will, of course, bring up the main Ubuntu page. Your enterprise relies on the cloud. Shouldn't you have seen its future? What is Ubuntu? You can read up on it. Up at the top middle, you're going to select Downloads, and we're going to select Ubuntu Desktop for our example. Now, what I decided to do is I got the... Uh, Ubuntu 12.10, which is the latest features, and I can select the drop down there, and I did 64-bit because I'm actually going to be installing this on a 64-bit vir virtual machine. Then I selected Get Ubuntu 12, and I downloaded the image to my computer. Now, my particular image is actually saved on my Google Drive. I know it sounds weird to you guys, but I paid for all the storage, so I might as well just leave it there. <laughs> but here I have right here Ubuntu 12.10, dash slash desktop slash AMD64. Now, something that I should probably fill you guys in on with this is actually, uh, it's not always uh, something like you're going to install on a virtual machine. If you decide to install Linux on a disk, you can burn that image into a disk right in Windows 7. It's very easy to do. You've got to use an image burning utility. Uh, for the virtual machine, it's nice because we don't have to burn a disk to make it happen. But uh, if you double click on the image, let me show you here real quick. You double click on the actual Linux image right in Windows 7. Pull it back up. It'll actually, oh, I'm sorry, I have Magic ISO Maker on here. If you right click on it, you can say Open With, and there's a Windows Disk Image Burner. Okay? That'll let you actually burn it straight to a, a bootable disk that you can put in your computer, boot up, and install Windows on. We're not going to be doing that in this particular tutorial, but it is an option. Now I'm going to open up Oracle again. Remember, you're going to need Oracle VM VirtualBox, and you also download Ubuntu from their website. Again, I do have Ubuntu at my website as well. Free downloads, uh, operating systems, full systems, and then go to Linux Ubuntu. Okay, so you can get it there as well. I try to keep everything at my website so you guys can have reference to it. So then select New right here in the VirtualBox, and I'm going to type in my Ubuntu installation. Now notice that 
This actually detects immediately what my operating system type and version are. This is a, a virtual box feature. But if it didn't, you can just select the, select the drop down and select Linux, and then select the version. And this did Ubuntu, but I'm actually installing Ubuntu 64-bit. This is very important that you select the proper one, because it will not install properly if you do not. Go ahead and select Next. Personally, I like to give my, uh, my guest operating systems at least a gigabyte of memory, so I'll go ahead and give uh, Ubuntu 1024. I'd probably recommend 2048 if you have it, so I'll go ahead and do that. Select Next, and then right here, I'm going to create a virtual hard drive, and it does give me a recommended size of 8 gigabytes. So I'll just go ahead and keep that the same. 8 gigabytes is a... 8 gigabytes I'm going to be able to change here in the future, but I do want to create a hard drive now because I don't have an existing one, and I do, uh, do not want to not add one and use one later. Uh, using an existing is a great way to recreate an installation, but we're just going to create one for now and click Create. And I usually use the virtual box disk image. These are just different formats you can save your operating system and select Next. Now, this is probably the most critical part. This is for your hard drive. You want to make sure you dynamically allocate your hard drive size because otherwise it's going to chew up that hard drive space immediately off of your disk. So I have 59.8 gigabytes remaining. Uh, so if I say dynamically allocated, it's only going to use up from my hard drive what I use in that operating system. If I say fixed, it'll automatically grab all that memory. So I'm going to keep that dynamic. And then here, this is something that's kind of frustrating, okay? They'll give you this 8 gigabyte max here, but uh, that's a max. You actually cannot, without going through, the, uh, through a command prompt and all that, you cannot actually resize this above 8 gigabytes without going through some headaches. This is a max size, so it's not actually going to use up that much unless you install that much stuff on your system. So I usually set that to 40 because it's very rare that I actually use up all of that space, about 40 gigabytes on the guest operating system. Then I just need to select Create. Okay. Now what this did is it created, as you can see, a little My Ubuntu installation here. And then it's a matter of clicking Settings right here at the top middle. And then the Settings up at the top, you've got to click Storage. And then we're going to mount that ISO file that I downloaded. So I'm going to click here right on this empty. See, that's a little CD-ROM drive. I'm going to right-click on that. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm going to double-click on it. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to set up right here on the right-hand side. And I'm going to click Choose a Virtual CD DVD Disk File. I'm going to go back to my Google Drive. That's where I saved it to. I'm going to select Ubuntu. And I'm going to select Open. And this will actually mount that CD to a virtual CD-ROM drive. It's much like putting in a disk, but uh, it's, it's virtualized instead. So you don't have to actually put in a physical disk. Now, you could have burned this and put in a physical disk. And then down here, when you select the right-hand side, you can actually say Host Drive. So you can actually host your D CD or DVD ROM drive if you want to install your operating system from a disk. So then select OK. And then now we need to actually power on the unit. So up here at the top, I'm going to select Start. And now at this point, it's actually going to be booting up, as you notice, inside of Windows. It's actually booting up my operating system. Let's make sure we're doing OK here on uh, our video feed. Let me make sure you guys can actually see what's going on. Let me reload while that's booting. And it's booting up. See, notice it booted Ubuntu 12.10. So it's booting up right now. It's booting up the installation. And it's going to actually go through a lot of this uh, in the initial, just much like... Oh, no. Somebody said my screen capturing isn't working. Can't notice anything if you can't see the screen. Can you guys see the screen? Hopefully you can. Because I'm still doing the screen cap. Let me wait for some feedback here. I want to make sure you guys can see the screen here. Uh-oh. That can't be good. It isn't showing it, is it? Let me click wait for some feedback here. I want to make sure you guys can see the screen here. So Google isn't letting me share my screen. Oh, look at that. It did it to me again. Wow. Okay. Where did I leave you guys off here? <laughs> Where do we leave off here? That's that six. Okay, here we got Ubuntu up. You probably guys probably didn't even notice any of that stuff. Let's go through it again real quick because I want to make sure that you guys follow this. I'll just what I'll do is I'll cut I'll cut off the beginning of this video for uh, or I'll cut it up and, and re-edit it actually later on. 
But uh, essentially, let me shut this down. I'm going to close my virtual machine, shut it down here, because you guys can probably see it now, I would guess. Let's just power off the machine here. Okay, let me go ahead and reload. Make sure you guys can see it. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. I apologize. I do this very often, this installation part of it. So let's go ahead and bring this back up. And now what I did here is I'm going to delete this whole one, remove. And I'm going to start over here. I'm going to click New. And I'm going to say My Ubuntu Installation. And then we're going to create a Linux. Notice you can choose a type here right from the drop down. And I did Linux. And then for Ubuntu, I, uh, you got to make sure you click this and go down to the 64-bit one because that's the disk I downloaded. Okay? And then after I've done that, I can click Next. And then actually what I usually do is I recommend uh, at least 2 gigabytes of memory. It really just depends on how much you have available. Uh, but if you have it, see I have 8 gigs. Uh, I usually recommend a, a minimum of uh, 2 gigs. So let's go ahead and just do, what's well, 2048 actually. Do 2 gigs of memory on mine. And I'm going to click Next. And then I'm going to create a virtual hard drive. Notice it says 8 gigabytes is recommended. We'll get to switch that a little bit later. Uh, we're not going to use an existing hard drive unless I already have one. And otherwise, you can choose Do Not Add if you plan on adding one later. I'm going to click Create to create one. And then I usually use the virtual box disk image to actually create the virtual box disk. Then I select Next. And then we're going to do Dynamically Allocated. And this just basically means, like I'd shown in video earlier, uh, well, in, in me just looking at my screen, uh, this is how much space I have left. It's 59.8. Dynamically allocated basically says it's not going to use up all of my allocated space for this drive, like the 8 gigs if I select 8 or 40. It's going to chew up my main hard drive space as I use it. If I do fixed size and say the size is going to be 40 gigs, then it's going to use up 40 gigs immediately, even if my uh, guest operating system isn't doing that. So I usually always recommend dynamically allocated. Then select Next. And this is where we can actually select the size of our drive. I usually do 40 gigabytes. 40 gigabytes is usually more than, uh, not 40. <laughs> yeah, well, the 40 gigabytes is what we want. 40 gigabytes. 40, the 40 point. 0 .00 GB. Okay, then click Create. Now what we have here is you'll notice on my list I got all these. I already have a previous installation on here, but if I do my Ubuntu installation, the one I just created, I can click Settings. So this is where I'm going to actually mount my CD image. Then I want to go to Storage, and here's my CD-ROM drive right here. Right now it's empty. Now I've got two choices here. I can either burn the image that I created. I downloaded from Ubuntu's website. That's right here, Ubuntu 12.1. I right-click on this and open with the Windows Disk Image Burner. I can burn it straight to a CD. But what us nerds like to do is we actually like to mount this Ubuntu installation directly to our virtual environment for the installation. So if I burned a CD on this little drop-down on the right hand here, I would click Host Drive, whatever my CD drive is, okay? But if I want to just mount this or host this image file, I'll just say choose a virtual CD DVD disk file, and then it'll actually select my Ubuntu disk image and select open, and then actually mounts the CD without actually putting in a CD to my virtual machine. Kind of a cool little feature. So then select OK, and then we want to start the operating system. You can either double click on it and click start right up here at the top. And here we are booting up for the first time for this Linux install installation for the second time, I guess I should say. Off to a rough start there on that one. Ahead. Sorry about that. And uh, what we're doing here, let's see how we do here. <laughs> I'm seeing if making sure you guys are still here. Okay. Now we're actually booting up our installation here. Now Ubuntu is a, like the most, it is currently the most popular Linux distribution out there. As you know, Ubuntu's kind of really been making astounding strides in wireless, I'm sorry, not wireless, but mobile technology. They got their own phones, their own tablets are coming out. And so this is what we can do here. Uh, we got it open. Notice it's not in full screen at the moment. If you're addicted to full screen, you can go view up here at the top and you can switch to full screen. Uh, but for the installation, I'm just going to keep it right here in this window for convenience. Uh, you can try Ubuntu without making any changes to your computer directly from the CD, which no, we don't want to do. We want to install Ubuntu. So check, choose your language on the left, and then choose Install Ubuntu. And this is going to actually load up our installation file. And it makes sure that all of your settings are correct. 
I can download the updates while installing. I'm not going to do that at the moment. And if I want to install third-party software like an MP3 plugin, this Fluendo MP3 plugin and things like that, you can choose to do that as well. I'd recommend installing all of it if I were you, your first installation. But for today's demonstration purposes, we're just going to go to next. Now, of course, we want to erase the disk. We just created a new disk anyway. It's a virtual disk, and we can encrypt it if we want it to be secure. Um, and this also lets you do a logical volume management. Um, it basically allows you to do instant partition resizing and snapshots of your hard drive for backup. It's really up to you if you want to do that or not, uh, but I usually don't myself. I don't encrypt it either. Uh, and if you want to, you can create and resize the partitions yourself. It really just depends on how you want to set up your installation. Essentially, it gives you advanced options for doing your installation. So then just select Continue, and it'll begin the installation. Now, the nice thing about a virtual machine in a virtual environment like this is it actually it does a lot of um, a lot of things really fast. Since it's not relying on my CD-ROM drive, it will actually um, let me. Uh, it'll actually install a lot quicker because it doesn't have to rely on the spinning CD-ROM drive to do the installation. It's actually installing it straight off that disk image. Now it's asking me where I live. Uh, Indianapolis, that's close enough. It's kind of nice. It's asking me for my basic settings. Test. Test the keyboard. And select continue if it works. My name. Craig. I'll be Craig VirtualBox. Sure, my username will be Craig. We'll just enter a blank password here. Oh, it's short. Who cares? Let's log in automatically. Now, of course, if you're security conscious, you want to have a strong password, capital letter, numer alphanumeric, and have a special character somewhere in there. And um, you can also encrypt your home folder, which, is, which has your, all of your main documents in it. And then go ahead and select Continue. And then it gives you some nice little slideshows of everything going on. Fast and full new features, the latest version of Ubuntu makes computing easier than ever. There are, here are just some cool new things to look out for. Find even more software. Say goodbye to searching the web for new software with Ubuntu Software Center. This is much like an app store. Actually, I'm really kind of a fan of how they did this. Uh, the app store setup will actually allow you to kind of go in and see pre-reviewed apps and games and things like that. And you can install them straight to the system with pretty much ease. It's really become a very user-friendly environment for almost any user. Uh, Ubuntu's done a fantastic job of that. Uh, you got a photo manager, GIMP, which of course is the Photoshop alternative. It's open source. Uh, Pitivi, video editor, is an open source video editor. It's pretty comprehensive for what you get, of course. Completely free. We love free here. As you guys know, if you follow the show at all, we love free. <laughs> it's what we talk about. It's what we live on. We live for free. It's what we live on. Whoa, endless, endless feed there. See how we're doing here back at the channel. We're just trying it out. Just trying it out. Seeing how things are going today. Things seem to go quite well. So far, we're installing Linux. Good stuff. Good stuff. And look, you can see me now in the video. That's one way I can show you guys in the video what's going on. Here's my XSplit software. It's actually kind of cool. I should do it that way. Let me move that over there. I was wondering how I could get you guys to see me while I was doing the video. Hi. How's it going? Now, I decided to do this because it was kind of a little bit of a switch up. Um, how is the quality on this, actually? It looked like Google actually will capture higher definition quality video captures for, for monitors, for screen captures, than they do for my actual video feed. So I'm kind of curious how it's turning out on the actual video feed. If I pull it up here, I want to see if we got anything going on here that's really kind of scary. Uh, it looks kind of scary, actually, from the little preview option there. Ha! <laughs> 480p. Yeah, it's not as pretty on yours as it is on mine. But hey, that's the problem with live streaming. It's one of the big difficulties, is you can't guarantee quality. But it's pretty easy to do. I mean, uh, if you make the image big enough, uh, you don't really have to worry about it too much. Uh, you got Rhythm Box Music Player. It's Ubuntu's one music store. Uh, what else do we have? Your own personal cloud. You get five gigabytes of free storage to access your files and stream your music. Always fun. Uh, we already did the image editor and video editor. Uh, we can do the Stay Connected. Of course, you can do all of your social media. Uh, it also has a built-in messenger for that, which is kind of nice. And then you have your built-in Flash, Chromium, Firefox, of course, all of the essentials for browsing, all of your essential need, needs for browsing, and LibreOffice. We love LibreOffice at the website. 
and at the community page. If you guys haven't joined the community, it's completely free, pcmtechhelp.com forward slash community. And we're all about sharing free stuff there. Um, like Compton Sue has been sharing tons of things, uh, and we've had just a lot of really got, really great people there hanging out, and it's been a lot of fun. And as you guys may or may not know, this show broadcasts live 9 p.m. Eastern to 10 p.m. Eastern, uh, Monday through Thursday. Okay, customize it. You can customize your appearance, your assistive technologies, and language support. And you can check out Ask Ubuntu for answers to all of your Ubuntu questions. There's a good chance your questions will have been answered already. So, that's where we're at on that. Looks like the installation is coming along quite well, actually. It shouldn't take much longer. And then we will, of course, get your questions. It would, we would have gotten to them by now had I just captured my screen properly during the beginning of this video. Sorry about that. I do apologize. I will get better at this. Episode 26. This is actually the first episode of the screen capture on, so I'm a little nervous about it even being worth the time. Uh, because, because the screen quality is so bad. It's hard to know uh, whether it's going to be beneficial to people or not. Uh, so I'd like, I'd like some big time feedback on that. Is, is this informational enough or, or visual, is it good enough to be learnable is my big question on this. Uh, will it at least get you by for the live streams? If I decide to do a software review or some kind of video installation or guide via live stream, is this good enough for that? Uh, and I've thought about streaming, streaming to a live service, but alas, the show doesn't make enough money to be able to afford the really good ones. Uh, so uh, that would probably be ideal. Um, as you guys know, I did add a donate button to the main homepage. So if you guys donate, it will contribute to that area of the business as well, the growth of that. Uh, installation is complete. Check this out. You need to restart the computer in order to use the new installation. We'll restart now. And this is what I love about virtual environments is I can actually restart it while, you know, while we're doing our video feed. You know, my main operating system doesn't make this not work properly. So I can actually walk you through the complete installation right here magically via internets. But uh, I'm thinking I might have to invest in higher live stream quality for this because this seems like a, something that would be a lot of fun for you guys. Would it be worth it, guys, if I, if I drop the money? It's expensive. On live stream, you think it would be worth it? You think it would help the show grow? If we had HD, well, it's probably 720p is all my computer can handle live streaming. Um, and I don't know what website to use. I think maybe Livestream.com would be my best bet. But uh, it, they do tend to get resource intensive is one of the downsides, depending on what it is. So supposed to be going down for reboot. Looks like it's taken some time. It was supposed to be 15 seconds. I'm going to go ahead and send a control delete here. Failed to connect the socket. That's never good. We'll just do a hard reset. Sometimes, you know, virtual machines, they're not all that savvy on the reboot method. Okay, now our operating system will reboot in our virtual environment. And hopefully it won't make a liar out of me. We're doing our first time Linux boot, Linux Ubuntu. There's our desktop. We'll do view. Uh, we'll switch to scale mode. And what we're going to do is I'm going to actually scale this larger. I want you guys to see this a little better on your screen. And the resolution might look a little funny to you because I'm scaling it awkwardly. But it'll at least allow me to get it a little bigger for you. And here is our Ubuntu desktop. Of course, we can have a brief overview here. It looks somewhat similar to your Windows 7 one, except for your bars on the left instead of the top. It does come pre-installed with all the LibreOffice wonderful things. Of course, you have Firefox pre-installed. Everybody loves that. Your home folder, which will contain all of your wonderful documents. It looks like it's running really bad right now because I'm doing live streaming and everything at the same time, so you'll have to bear with it on that. But uh, it has all your documents, desktop, music. It looks like almost like a hybrid between Windows 7 and Windows Vista. Um, when, <laughs> wow, Windows 7 and, I'm sorry, Mac. Uh, here's the software center. This is one of the coolest features of the actual uh, software, uh, the Linux distribution. Software center is a real cut and dry way to install new software right on your operating system. And like I said, it's formatted just like an app store, like you're used to working with on any uh, device you might have had. So on the left-hand side here, I can say, oh, I'm looking for something for internet, right? And so internet, can I can do chat, file sharing, mail, web browsers, let's do web browsers. 
look, it's Chromium. We love Chromium. I can select it, click install, and magically, look over here, magically, we're running. Of course, I need to authenticate it with my awesome secure password. <laughs> and then it installs. It's that simple. It really is. It's, it's a wonderfully simplistic operating system. And guess what? It's completely free. We all love free. Got Amazon, One Music, System Settings, and obviously you got a workspace switcher here, so you can have multiple desktops. You can have more than one desktop running at the same time. Very cool stuff. And let's see what we got going on here as well. We got Dash Home, which will let me do a quick search of all my applications. Another cool, nice little built-in feature to Ubuntu. All of your power settings are up here in the right-hand corner. That's similar to Mac, but on the opposite side. Uh, you can do your guest sessions, you can create new users, go to system settings, and see all the wonderful various properties of your operating system. Very straightforward, very easy to use, very fun operating system. Definitely worth checking out. So let's go ahead and shut it down. That's how you install Ubuntu Linux on your computer. Let me make sure I can shut it down. My virtual machine's struggling a little bit because my computer is probably having fun streaming HD the same time of, you know, just power off, <laughs> as everything else. So essentially, that's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. That's how you install Ubuntu Linux right on your operating system. So that was my experiment for today, for the intro of this video. We are going to move into the question and answer segment of the show. And my question to you, initially, to start off the Q&A, remember, you got to go to the YouTube channel for that, youtube.com forward slash I'm sorry, pcmichigana.com forward slash YouTube, and I'll bring you straight to the YouTube video. You can post any questions you'd like there, and we will, I will do the best to answer them for you. And let's see how this turned out. We're going to start right at the beginning, and we're going to see how this goes, okay? Lord Lightning says, first, take that, Tom. Darn second, says B Hunter. J Ray, second. Welcome to the community, everybody. Welcome back from the community, everybody. It's good to have you all back here. Everyone saying Illuminati. Yep. The Illuminati shirt. Yep, I did wear my Illuminati shirt today. My mic is crackling a bit. Oh, man, I'm all over the place. Don't tell me. I, yeah, that's why. Here you go. All of a sudden, we go from bad audio to magical audio. That would be why. Kind of wish I had gotten that from the beginning. Man, can you guys tell I'm out of practice? Can you tell I'm out of practice? That's what I get from missing three days last week, right? Very good stuff. I was just going to say you could install Linux through VMware, said Lord Lightning. VMware is another great, uh, if you go to VMware Player, is another great way to install Linux right on your operating system. Welcome back, Reb1990X, Steve Willer. Um, Any but Ubuntu Unity, use Lint Mint. Stream died, quality died, quality back, sellout. <laughs> Everyone's calling me a sellout. That's nice. Oh, can't even install graphics card drivers. Will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, my job is, I actually do electrical engineering on the side. Uh, well, no, it's my main job, I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, got my degree in informatics, which is a, sw a hybrid between, it, I chose business and technology, and information technology. So that was one of the main reasons I kind of got into the whole starting my own web business thing. So uh, there's not really a whole, a whole lot to say. Uh, I don't know. What do you want to know specifically? Religion, is it relevant? Uh, family, is it relevant? I, you know, I guess there's certain things I don't... Uh, I don't <laughs> not that I'm ashamed of my beliefs, but <laughs> it's not really something I want people to have me sway whether I'm useful to them or not based on my religion. So, And a lot of people do that these days. What's up with that? Compton Sue says, Hi, Craig. Welcome back, Compton. Lloyd says, I can't notice anything if I can't see the screen. Sorry about that, Lloyd. Would getting a PCI 32-bit to PCI Express 16X be worth it instead of a 400-watt power supply for my video card? Uh, you're talking about a converter, J-Ray? At the PCI 32-bit to PCI Express 16X be worth it? Even if it's a converter, it'll, either, it'll still downgrade to the original PCI slot speed. Uh, and, and there's no real good advantage to downclocking your graphical power. There's no advantage to it. There's only a disadvantage. If you don't have the juice necessary to run the card, get the juice necessary to run the card. Because if you come up with some workaround so that you don't need to upgrade the power supply, you're probably downpowering the graphics card to get it to work, and that will actually reduce your performance on the card. 
Not to mention, if you're replacing your old PCI, which I don't think is called 32-bit, uh, but your old PCI Express slot or your old PCI slot to a 16x, you're you're down down clocking your bandwidth on your motherboard as well. So you don't want to do that. So uh, looks so now it works. Okay, everyone's back. Mouse is being mouse is being lazy. Okay, we'll see how that goes. Lord Lighting says, "Were you a nerdy kid like me when you were 12?" Absolutely, probably nerdier actually. SD and Tendog says, well, hello there, Craig. Seeing you playing with Ubuntu makes me happy. Glad to hear it. I had to try it out. Had to give you guys something to work with there on Linux. I haven't really given anybody any uh, any time with it. And I'd like to do a few of them, you know, just go through do some software reviews and things like that. If it works out on this screen capture that people are really kind of into the whole recording area of it, then, um, then we'll go ahead and do that. So stop it. You're making me want to switch to Linux, says Lord Lightning. Well, hey. I can't make you want to do it, but hey, if, if, if you're stuck with Windows 8, Linux, Ubuntu Linux is a solid alternative to Windows 8, a very solid alternative. So if you're really interested in trying out a new operating system, it's very user-friendly, very easy to use, very easy to install. It, there's just so, it's easier to install than Windows. So it's, it's really like, what do you do? You know, it, it's worth the shot. I'm telling you, it's worth the shot. If you're really considering it. This turtle thinks it's funny. Pecom Fun Fan 97 says, Hi Craig. Hey Pecom, welcome back. Lord Lightning says it's 823 and divide by zero is probably the infinite screen thing. Uh, Pecom Fun Fan 97 says, Have you checked out my channel lately? Looks a bit different. Uh, I can check it out for you real quick. And this is fine. If you guys have like a YouTube channel that you want me to take a look at, and we will take a look at it together, assuming that my screen share actually shares you know, because I actually pressed the button right, then we will look at it, we'll check it out and see how it looks. Uh, but uh, let's see what you got here. You got, okay, Mac OS X Help and App Reviewer. Hey, look, I know exactly what you do now. Awesome. Great addition right here at the top. Very cool, very cool. 258 subscribers. Congratulations. Looks like you're moving up in the world. Uh, you have your social media links on the right. I like that. Um, I would suggest if you have a home page, you put it there as well. If you don't, that's fine. It's no big deal. A lot of people do stuff just on YouTube. Uh, video editing is your thing. I upload videos every Monday, Tuesdays, and Fridays. So it sounds like you have a set schedule. Very good news for subscribers. And uh, you're encouraging them to choose the like button. Speaking of which, if you're at my video right now, choose, pick, click the like button and click subscribe. Check it out. Top four, good. Uh, I like your thumbnails. Very cool. Uh, very cool idea there. I like this little bottom left-hand co corner thing you got here. This number four you have. Very cool effects on that. I like that a lot. Uh, very good additions. I like how it's coming along. I think the last time I came here, I was really happy with this background. I really liked your background here. Very cool. Very designistic. Uh, my first impression is that stylistic and stylish. Uh, the only thing that's kind of different here that I would say kind of isn't that it's kind of blah is your logo. Uh, it doesn't really pop out to me in anything unique. It reminds me of VV Comp Helps, and it doesn't really, if you're, if you're branding it, that's cool, uh, but I don't really know it's the PFF unless I look really close, and it does kind of blend with the outside. Maybe suggest something a little more crisp here in your logo area, uh, but really your thumbnail here, there's a pretty fantastic. That's, that's pretty cool. I, I'm kind of jealous, actually. I wish mine looked that good. <laughs> and so, and so uh, it's just really kind of a cool setup you got. I like it. Looks like you on the right-hand side, you have products and reviews. You have them organized really well. Uh, so keep it up. It looks good. Um, I definitely, definitely you're heading in the right direction. Uh, I haven't listened to your videos at all. I'm assuming you talk in your, in your reviews. So uh, cool addition, cool, uh, cool share. I, I, think, uh, I think you're coming along quite well there. And if anybody else has any what channels they want me to look at, that's more than fine. I don't mind doing it. I actually enjoy doing it. I've been staring at stuff for quite some time. But it does look like that PFF is your logo. I've noticed it now on your avatar. And that's fine. Uh, the only reason I was saying is it doesn't really pop. You know, it doesn't really, it doesn't say something about your brand. Uh, I decided a while ago to brand myself so that people recognize my face. Because a face is one of the most recognizable characteristics uh, and unique characteristics about anything. And so the fa people recommend now that if you brand yourself, which is an option, you don't have to brand yourself. But if you're branding a uh, personality, you just use your face. Because 
if somebody looks at a face, they recognize it. It's unique. It's something that stands out. But if you're going to brand a logo or something specific, you have to create something that does kind of pop and that will be vividly memorable. So uh, maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe you've had a lot of really good feedback on it. I could be wrong, so it's entirely possible. Lloyd, 1985-1012 says, 2.24 a.m. here. Wow, dedicated. Tom Proke says, bedtime for Lord Lightning. Lord Lightning X says, we got to get to questions. <laughs> J. Ray K says, two-hour show, please. I don't think I can pull that off. <laughs> i still got to paint my upstairs, guys. <laughs> um... Looks like everybody's making fun of each other. Good times. Uh, <laughs> or Lightning says, I tried to copy my school's Microsoft Office folder in English class right in front of the whole class. So nerdy. Update. I did successfully get their files. I don't know if that's a good thing. Thief. I'm calling your school. Turning you in. I'm just kidding. Lord uh, Lloyd says, I would prefer to be able to read the information on screen. Yeah, that would be good. Lord Lightning says, don't drop the money. I suggest you wait till we get 250 or 300 members, then invest. Not that bad of an idea. Why why pay when YouTube gives it to you for free? They don't give me HD for free, though. That's the problem. If I want to do this live, I, this is the best I get. This is the best quality I can get live streaming. So if I decided just to do the video reviews not live, I could pay. I mean, I, I, could, I could do the full HD on YouTube. But if I'm streaming live, I can't do that. So... Use Twitch TV, Justin TV, or Ustream, or Livestream TV. That's pretty much all the available options out there. Uh, B Hunter says HD streaming would be cool, but I really like the YouTube environment. I do too. That's kind of one of my problems. I have trouble. Uh, Lord Lightning says don't invest until we're really popular. And this was a question like I asked earlier. It, it's just, at what point do you say, well, I'm not really popular because I haven't invested. And, and I haven't invested because I'm not really popular. And it's just that kind of delicate balance there. If I can find a way... Uh, if I can find a way to kind of hybridize the two and just come up with a good streaming solution, I'd like to have a streaming solution with a chat room embedded because a chat room offers more flexibility for you guys as well to interact with me as a user. Uh, but again, this isn't offered by Google Plus Hangouts yet. Uh, I have a feeling they're going to get there, but there's no official announcement when it's going to come. There's none of that. So it's really difficult for me to kind of decide on how to approach it. Uh, Kevin Bragdon says, like it. Keep up the good work. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Ubuntu would be great as a TV computer. It's entirely possible. It's probably not something they haven't considered down the line. Um, Lloyd1985-1012 says, no problem, Craig. How do you install GPU drivers on Linux? Well, you're going to stump me here. But the good news is, is we have some Linux, uh, no, some Linux connoisseurs at the community page, pcmtechhelp.com forward slash community. Uh, I've had some issues installing GPU drivers. I'm sure you have to download a specialty driver that's actually created by the community in order to get the installation to go through properly. But I don't have very much experience in that area because, as you noticed, I use virtual machines, and virtual machines very rarely need graphics drivers. They use a, a base uh, virtualized graphic driver. So that's kind of what happens. Um, my sound doesn't work. Oh, please tell me you're kidding. <laughs> it says your sound doesn't work anymore. Oh, boy. Oh, okay, good. Freaked me out there, Jay Ray. Uh, Ivan says, hi, everyone. Welcome back, Ivan. B Hunter says, for the GPU driver, you can go to additional drivers in the settings. So there you go. That's one great way to get to it. Uh, Craig, sound good. I'm glad it came back. 1990X says, is there any tricks to bypassing my Windows login fingerprint reader scanner, like a paper print image of my finger fingerprint? It depends on the fingerprint scanner you're, you're looking at, um, and it also depends on how they decide to do the security on the scan. Usually, a, I, wouldn't think a, I wouldn't think a printed image would work because it's probably looking for a reflective surface as well, so some kind of a natural reflective surface on the scan. I find it hard to believe that you could get the same quality of image on a, on a photo. I've never tried it, though, that being said. But I'd, I'd like to believe that a simple photocopy of your thumb wouldn't bypass it because it kind of defeats the purpose of it being very secure. But I guess who's going to do that really? Who's going to go through that much trouble of getting a photocopy of your thumbprint and actually using it to open up your system? So I don't really have a good answer to that. Unfortunately, I haven't tried to bypass a fingerprint scanner. That'd be a good question for the community because I've never tried it. Uh, but I know a lot of people, if it's a Windows login, 
you can bypass a Windows login by cracking it using like an NT Unlock or NT Cracker software. Um, uh, NT Password Reset is really popular. Um, this one's good. Uh, offline NT Password and Registry Editor is a real popular one. Uh, offline, that's from Pogo Stick. And so these are these are kind of some um, some good tools that are available that IT people tend to use. Usually, you only use it when people lock themselves out of the system, though. You know, don't use it for unethical purposes. Not usually suggested, but um, a lot of times you can just bypass. If it's a Windows security, you can just bypass the Windows security sometimes just by going in through safe mode as administrator. Sometimes it just depends on what it, how it's set up. Reb, you should try smashing the finger swipe that you log in. I don't think that'll work. <laughs> J. Ray K says, sound. You, st I, you still can't hear me? Hopefully you can hear me. I'm looking at my levels. My levels are going up and down. People haven't left yet, so hopefully it's just you. Sorry. Reb Light next says, Reb, if you can log in using a password, then Google a login bypass or disk image. I bet you'll find plenty. That's what I was talking about. Jack P. says, time for bed. I like the comments, guys. It helps out the channel. That's all I gotta say. The more comments, the better. Because Google and YouTube take into account the amount of activity on the video stream when they're actually determining search results. So activity is heavily important on uh, live stream success, uh, community success. And when people talk, it does encourage other people to talk and ask questions. And I, of course, encourage everybody to ask questions. It doesn't bother me at all. So, um, <laughs> so uh, I, I'm, it doesn't bother me at all. So, S Nintendo says, "Don't look at my channel. As it has nothing still yet. Maybe another. Oh, I'm gonna look at it. You told me not to. I'm looking at. Oh, dude, you have nothing. You have nothing at your channel. What's up with that? You have 56 uploaded videos, though." <laughs> Do a Mr. Bean with the painting. <laughs> Pecan Fun Fan says, you should do the Harlem Shake. If you've never heard of it, then just Google it. I did do the Harlem, Sh Harlem Shake. Actually, a community member made a Harlem Shake fan video off the last time that I did it. And it might be a, a little bit of time before you convince me to do it again. Jack B says, Craig, what's your favorite flavor of Linux? Right now, Ubuntu, because I'm not a huge Linux guy, usually. Not that I don't like Linux. I've just never really sat down to work with it exclusively. Um, but uh, I'm kind of like the guy where the, my favorite flavor of Linux is going to be the one that applies to my specific need at the time. So if I wanted, like, free NAS or something, it depended on what I wanted to do, I would want an operating system of Linux designed for exactly what I'm going to be doing with it. So it's kind of a trick question. It's a loaded question at the same time. <laughs> Lord Lightning's having a little bit of fun here doing the Harlem Shake. Um, he says he likes Zorn, Ubuntu, Backtrack, and Deviant. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. Russell Adams says, better late than never. Very true. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for coming out, Russell. Mechanical Toaster. Which is better for you, Linux, Ubuntu, or Windows 7? Probably Windows 7 in my case, because I like way too much software on the Windows operating system that isn't available on Linux. That being said, I do like free. So the nice thing about Linux is pretty much everything you get on it is going to be free. So, and it's always easy to find on Linux. They have the fancy tools and that nice little app store right in Ubuntu that will actually get you to where you need to go for whatever utility or tool you need. It. It's just, it's awesome. It's awesome. Lloyd, 1985-1012, is help, heavily help, helping me out by adding a whole bunch of uh, junk comments, I think. A, B, and B, A. Oh, something is missing in my background. Can you guess what it is? I don't know what you're talking about. Here it is. I was all not today. I was totally unprepared today. It's a Monday, people. It's a Monday here at the PCM Tech Help Show. Totally a Monday. It's uh, one of those wonderful, wonderful, frustrating Mondays. B Hunter, I think you can disable the Windows fingerprint, fingerprint login. Yeah, but can you do it without bypassing it or without getting into it one, at least once and then disabling it? That's the question. Can you bypass it is the question. And usually you can log in as an administrator through safe mode and not worry about it. 
or you can get like a Windows NT password cracker and things like that. There's usually some some ways around it. Uh, in this particular case, I'm not aware of one exactly for the fingerprint one. That's a tricky question. Lokish TPB, hey Craig, this exams period is exams period for us. Missing your live shows. I'll tune in daily from the 19th of March. Wish me all the best for my exams. Very good luck. I'm glad to hear you're dedicating yourself to your school rather than uh, entertainment, because this is ultimately entertainment. I like to think of it as informal, informational entertainment, but uh, I appreciate your, uh, your loyalty and you stopping by and letting me know. It's awesome. It is not only exam time for you, a lot of people. So hang in there and good luck and study hard and get a lot of sleep. It's my best recommendation. Make sure you get plenty of sleep before you take your test. makes all the difference in the world. Kevin Bragdon says, do you like the latest version of Vast? I do. It's visually more, uh, more appealing, in my opinion. It's easier to use. Uh, the UI is a little more loaded. One of the downsides, it is more a little more resource intensive. But it is still uh, is a very solid release. And honestly, I think it's been a, a long time coming for a Vast to finally release a visually more appealing version of their operating system, of their antivirus. For those of you who don't know what Avast is, it's a free antivirus utility. You can get it on my website, pcmtechup.com forward slash downloads. And uh, all you have to do is register to get it free for a year. And it's awesome. Tom Prokes likes PinGuy 12.04 LTS for uh, Linux distributions. I haven't tried that one out yet. Maybe we'll do an install video on that one. Xlord Lightning X says, "What's the difference between Bash and Batch? I know Bash is used in Mac. Bash is a actual uh, wow, that's an old extension. It's it's a it's like a tag, a Bash tag. I'm trying to remember, man, like a Bash file. I think it's a script file. I think it's a the type of language that's written. Uh, difference between Bash and Batch and Bash files. Difference between Batch and Batch files. Of course, a Batch file is in Windows. It's actually a a scripting file. So you actually write the file and then you uh, illustrate it as dot bat and then when you double click on it, it will execute it in a command prompt through DOS. And I'm assuming bash is not. Bash is done through a different type of prompt, not uh, not uh, DOS. Uh, let's see what we got here. Let's see how my knowledge tests out here. Batch is a terminology, terminology more normally used for a text file containing a sequence of MS DOS shell commands. Bash is a Unix shell and normally the equivalent term for Unix to a batch file is shell script, or simply script. So bash is actually a Unix shell. So it's much like your, your actual command line shell for executing commands. It's not actually the script. So the shell would be a shell script after that point. So I guess your shell would be more like you actually opening up your command prompt in Unix. I'm trying to break this down. And then when you write a script inside that or a pre-written script, it's called a shell script. Whereas DOS is just like your DOS shell is just like opening up DOS and you've got your command line. You can type whatever you want in it. But a DOS batch file would be you actually be writing a custom script like in a text document and saving it as a .bat. And then when you double click on it, it'll execute it in DOS. So very, very similar concepts, just two different operating systems. One's batch, one's batch. One's Unix, one's... I'm sure you, uh, Bash is also used in Linux. I'm sure it is. Oh, look at that. Bash is actually a shell in Unix slash Linux. There we go. We got to the bottom of that one. Good question, actually. I like that one. Lloyd, 1985, 10, 12. Mr. Bean, as in put dynamite in the paint pot and hide until he goes off and paints your room. Wouldn't that be easier? I wish I could do that. I really wish I could do that upstairs. Don't think my wife would approve of that paint job. J. Ray K says, how to change desktop environments in Kubuntu? Haven't used Kubuntu. In Ubuntu, it's very easy to do. You can just click it in the bottom left-hand corner and boom, choose your environment. Um, but uh, with Kubuntu, not familiar, best to ask that question at the community, pcmtechhelp.com forward slash community. I know you already know where that's at, but hey, that's how it goes. Mechanical Toaster says, yeah, yeah, pretty much true. Um, that's that's the reason I haven't switched from Windows, man, is, is because I just got so many applications that uh, I rely on so heavily, so I don't really do it. Pcom Funfan 97 says, why doesn't anyone have a YouTube background, and am I the only one with it? People usually don't want to go through the trouble to create one, and it's very difficult to create one, believe it or not. Did you make that yourself? Because it was actually very stylish. I liked it. X Lord Lightning X says, how was MS-DOS coded made if there are no operating systems before then? Well, there were operating systems before then, uh, but there was more like an assembly programming language. 
and <sighs> there's a lot of things that came before DOS. Uh, I, and I remember it goes all the way back to the punch card programming, and what they would do is they would actually poke holes in punch cards, and they would feed it into a computer, and that computer would compile the assembly language. I believe hex and assembly language were before DOS, and you would have to you'd have to feed in these cards one at a time and then the, co the computer, the massive supercomputer which was the size of an entire building would compile it one card at a time and as you can imagine if you had a hanging chad or a, uh, uh, a missed punch you'd actually have to go back and recheck every card because you didn't get compiler feedback if something didn't work so you'd have to go back and recheck all of your code what came immediately before DOS though um, is Let's see what we got here. Oh man, that's too much information. Let's go to oldest OS. I'd say uh, DOS was the first official operating system. Unix was originally developed in 1969 by a group of AT&T employees. DOS was uh, made during the 80s, so I guess Unix technically is a precursor to DOS. And it was very heavy in academic circles. Uh, but uh, the first computer did not have operating systems. So I'm not really sharp on my history, but uh, it doesn't surprise me. What they would do is they would code these things in assembly, and, and you'd actually have to feed them into, you'd have to feed them in there somehow. It would be hexadecimal or assembly language. So... That's an excellent question. Very interesting. Very interesting. I've lost you guys. Lost you guys. Where are you at? Very cool. Uh, Tom Prog says, "Do not take advice." Okay, we're going to skip over that. Holy boy, zero nine zero one nine seventy zero. How do you feel about hacking or cracking? I'm all for them as long as they're in a controlled environment. Uh, I don't. Obviously, I don't condone any kind of hacking that actually compromises the integrity of a security system and that's not your own because hacking in general is is the ultimate form of security testing uh, cracking is obviously cracking software that isn't your own uh, what are the ultimate goals I mean you hit a moral gray area there gray area there if you're trying to do it just to learn and educate yourself and inform yourself I'm not really that heavily against it but you know you have to be very careful there's a difference between hacking for educational purposes within your own controlled environment and you probably are breaking the law if you hack software and crack software so be aware of what your legal rights are and what you're doing uh, but uh, you know I can't say yeah it's great to break the law okay but hacking and cracking is one of the ways that many 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 students learn network security software security and all those kinds of different avenues for um, becoming professional law-abiding workers you know it's not always all a bad thing so it's not bad to you know compile it all together so John Rapat says you are cool you're saying that because you have an Ubuntu Linux logo avatar aren't you <laughs> thank you Ivan Lalegard says it's important to have a hard disk divided why uh, not necessarily important to have your hard disk divided there's not a whole lot of benefit to it except for organizational I recommend dividing up a hard disk into separate drives. I would have my main operating system on a solid state hard drive, and then I would have a second hard drive that has all my programs and stuff installed on it, like uh, or my non-critical system files, and all my resource-intensive programs would be installed on a separate solid state system drive because it's faster. Uh, other than that, there's no real advantage to partitioning on a drive as far as speed is concerned. It's more for organizational purposes and maybe for dual booting, having different operating systems on different partitions and things like that. So it's just, an, it's just a, a capability that allows you to have more features on a single drive. That's what partitioning really allows you to do. So you don't have to go out and buy five drives that have five operating systems. You can have five on one. Lloyd says, how many words do you say in a day? Probably more than I should. B Hunter says, Hiron's Boot CD has password resetting with a lot of other cool stuff. Hiron's Boot CD, very popular one. That one's shared at the community page quite often. It's a complete boot CD that has a whole bunch of tools built into it for tweaking, optimizing, and troubleshooting a computer. Very awesome tool. Check it out. Join the community. We share all kinds of awesome stuff like that. 
So make sure you swing by there. PCMTechHelp.com forward slash community. Lloyd says, because they might fight. I don't know. Better not. No fighting allowed. Rev1990X says, I should put glue on my finger and let... Oh, glue on my finger and then let it dry and peel off to see if the FP scanner reads it. I didn't know if you were going to say something bad there, so I stopped. <laughs> Lord Lightning says, I love Bash. I program it every day. Pecan Fun Fan 90 says, well, I'm 14 experience with Photoshop a bit. 14, if you started doing Photoshop heavily, you'll be a freaking genius by the time you're my age. That's 14 years by the time you got to my age. Mechanical Toaster says, do you think Linux Ubuntu is good enough for beginners? Absolutely. It is the one to go to. If you're nervous about Linux at all, go with Ubuntu first. I mean, it streamlines the entire process for you. And after you've gotten comfortable with it and what's out there and what's available for it and the software in it, then you can start experimenting with other distributions. But right now Ubuntu is the most popular for a reason. It appeals to the broadest range of users and user at different experience levels. So awesome. Very awesome operating system. Definitely worth experimenting with. It's awesome. I love it. Mechanical. I like. I think Mac and Linux are good for noobs. So is Windows. Uh, they're all pretty much good for noobs. Uh, and Linux isn't always good for noobs because it depends on the distribution you get. Holy Boy in 019780 says, can you do some tutorials and batching techniques such as starting up programs, starting or stopping services, etc.? I don't have a list of batch commands. Let me see if I still have that. Batch programming can get quite extensive. Um, my experience is limited. I've really only done what I've had to do. What I'm going to do here is I, I use this website almost exclusively for my batch command. It's uh, batch files and batch commands. It's just a reference. And you can literally see examples of all of your code and what operating system they currently support all the way up to uh, NT. And then uh, kind of just start playing with them in a text file and then save the text files.bat. And really, that's really the best way to learn. Uh, let me post it right here in the community page. Batch. Programming. I'll paste it right here in there. <laughs> there we go. Share. So that's at the community page, pcmtechup.com forward slash community. And you guys didn't tell me. It's past 10 o'clock. Okay. We're in the question roundup segment. And the question roundup segment is where I do my best to answer all of your questions. And if I can't answer them, make sure you swing by the community page, pcmtechup.com forward slash community, and they will help you out. Because I'm just one guy and I've only got one hour. I can only do so much given the time I have, and I really wish I could answer all of your questions. But hey, that's why I'm building a community, so they can help me out. They're awesome. PCM Tech Help shows philosophies. We love to have fun doing computer stuff, learning about it, playing around with it, having you know all kinds of jokes with it, experimenting with everything completely free. My website has over 80 free downloads, and I'm adding to it as often as I can. PCMTechHelp.com forward slash downloads. Of course, my YouTube channel and my website has over 450 written and video tutorials. PCMTechHelp.com forward slash community or just PCMTechHelp.com. Now make sure you tune in Monday through Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern, and we are going to go into the question roundup segment where I do my best to answer your questions to the best of my ability, and we will see how it goes. Holy Boy 0197 says, asks if I can do the tutorials. I can try to do some tutorials on batching. Don't know what kind of demand it has for it at the moment, but uh, I'll be more than happy to help you out with some batching if you are in there. Jonathan Williams says, hi. Hey, Jonathan. Welcome to the show. Lloyd1985-01012 says, if 0 is 0 and 1 is 1, what is question mark? Well, it depends. How many bits are there in your byte? Probably eight. So you have six more bits. Zero is zero and one is one. Let's say it's the second bit, then your answer is two. John Rapath, have you ever heard about Kiwi Linux? I have, actually. I started out with Ubuntu on this tutorial because I wanted to try something familiar and I also wanted to do something that was really popular and would be very popular amongst new users of Linux. But I am not against trying out different distributions of Linux. J. Ray K says, do you remember BBS chat system? Do you think it could have worked better than IRC? Mm, don't know a whole lot about BBS. IRC caught on because it was simplistic and very scalable, very easy to actually kind of create uh, servers and communities within it. And it still kind of goes strong in its own little niche community. But uh, I don't know a whole lot about BBC myself, so I couldn't tell you. Rev1990X says, have you heard of Windows Blue? This was brought up from Jack B yesterday at the Hangouts. Windows Blue is the update, much like Service Pack, for uh, Windows 8 operating system. And what's unfortunate about Microsoft is that they are retitling it something, but it's not really anything different. 
Uh, it's their attempt to try to market it as being something different than what Windows 8 really is, and of course Windows 8 is still Windows 8, and if you don't like Windows 8, you're probably not going to like Windows 8 blue, because it's not going to make much of a difference to you. It's going to be a patch, a very big patch that might actually cause problems for a majority of users. I know I'm talking fast, but we are in the question roundup segment. X Lord Lightning says, yes, but how do they make it? They couldn't make it on a PC, could they? Of course they could. They can make it on a processor. A processor is just a whole bunch of transistors that turn on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off, all day long. And so the idea is that you need to create an electrical signal that translates that information into words. Assuming that you had a basic system of bit level addressing, all bit level addressing is eight zeros in a row, and that has 256 states. No, eight bits has much more than 256 states. Essentially, your 8 bits has a set amount of states. No, it is 256. And so you have those different states that you can work with, and you can have each different state of bit level represent a different character in the alphabet. You can have it represent numbers. You can have it represent something else. And you can add these together, subtract these bits to get from each other, and compare the two, and that's essentially how a computer works at the processor level. So you can imagine this can actually be done on electrical transistors, not even within a processor. Big, huge vacuum tubes was how they did it. And you'd have big, huge, freaking electrical walls of transistors that turn on and off all day long. And that's how they used a computer. That's all it was, electrical signals. It's very sophisticated stuff if you look at it at that level. And it's amazing that you can, they can store like millions of them in just that little tiny chip now. Jack B says, thanks for the hit, Reb. Lord Lightning says, Microsoft is now a disgrace. Eh, I don't know about that. They might still keep in there. just depends. Pecom Fun Fate 97 says, I agree with you, Craig. Most people like to hack using brute force, cryptanalysis, and dictionary attacks. If you're doing it to learn, do it to learn. Tom Proke says, I thought you liked comments. I do like comments, Tom. Lord Lightning says, I'm cracking a zip file right now. Hey, whatever you want to do. Jonathan Williams says, how do you make contact, uh, a contact us form like this? Uh, Joniweb.zxq.net, but it works. Add the dot on that, and you can send a link on the chat. Jonathan, I don't really have a whole lot of time to go to a website right now. As you know, I'm in the question roundup segment. Please post that link at the community page, and I will try to take a look at it. Uh, contact forms are relatively sophisticated. Uh, you need to know how to do what's called a post method in scripting, uh, and it really depends on how, what your server supports on your hosting, and uh, essentially you create the form in HTML, but then you have to post the script, and it passes that information to a, a back-end server. That back-end server then translates that information and sends it back or sends it out through email, uh, but there's a lot of things you can do on that. How do you manually start trim in Windows 7? I think it's called the snipping tool. Snipping tool? Snipping. Yep, click the start menu button, type in snipping. Pecom Fun Fan says, we're probably in the quick question roundup, but I have read 100,000 words in my class. I think I'm the highest. Nice work. Lord Lightning says, task kill, end of process. It's one way to do it. Ivan Lagarigler, I can't pronounce your last name. There's a small basic from Microsoft. I don't know what that's for. I don't, uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, it's probably something you referred to earlier. So... Holy Boy says, thanks, man. No problem. Lord Lightning says, task skill, end of process, start name, start a task. Yeah, there's, oh, okay, you're talking about the commands. Yep, yep, that works out fine. Pecan Fun Fan 90 says, says, later, Craig. See you later. Jack B says, Craig, hope you don't wear the Illuminati shirt to bed. They'll come in. I knew it. I'm waiting for the Illuminati fairy to come and paint my room upstairs. That's what I was really hoping for. Holy Boy 091780. <laughs> Need a great site for troubleshooting, if you don't mind, as well. iFixit.com is great for Mac. Join the community. We'll help you out if you have any problems. And it really just depends on what you need. There's tons of different websites out there. Xlord Lightning X says, delete. Uh, he's talking about more uh, command line prompts. Holyboy09178 says, appreciate you giving back, man. What's the best way to give you support? Well, I do have a donate button at the website, pcmtechhelp.com, if you want to do monetary. But, of course, your time is also a great contribution. So just liking a video, sharing a video, commenting on a video, joining the community and participating is also an excellent way to get back to the show. Sharing content is an invaluable way for people who don't have money to donate to go ahead and contribute. It keeps the show growing, it keeps it going, and it is an ad-supported service, so the more views I get, the more traffic I get, the more subscribers I get, the more revenue the show gets. So it's built on that model, but you don't have to drop money if you don't have it, but if you donate, of course, it'll help as well if you don't have the time. So 
That option is available to you at the website, pcmtechhelp.com. It's in the bottom right-hand corner of each page. Road1990X says, night, Mr. Chamberlain. Uh, Lloyd says, what's the best for gaming, AMD 16-core or Intel 6-core? Well, processing power doesn't have a whole lot to do with gaming anymore. It's mostly based on graphics, so make sure that you have a good graphics card instead of spending that extra money on your processor. If you want more specific details and you want to post it at the community page. Lloyd, 1985, says, trim as in cleaning your SSD. Don't need to clean an SSD. Uh, don't clean out an SSD. Don't use any cleaning utilities. Don't use any defragmenters on it because SSDs have a certain lifespan of read and writes. And you don't get any performance gain on, gain on an SSD through defrag because it's so incredibly fast it makes no difference. J. Ray says, you're the best. No, man, you are. Pecan Fun Fan 9 says, says Legger de Silent E. Okay. Somebody removed a comment. Show one new comment. First comment at the end of the show. Wasn't really able to make it tonight. Thanks for coming out for the end of the show, though, Matt, because, hey, we have finished the end of the PCM Tech Help Show live stream. Don't forget to tune in tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern. I appreciate all of you guys coming out. And as well, if you want to join the community, check out the free downloads, share as much of this stuff as you can, like the video before you leave. And I want to leave you guys, of course, with this. Well, that probably could have gone a little smoother. Am I right? Yeah. Am I right? Am I right? I'll see you guys at the community.